Uh, hi, I'm Dr. David Weissman, and today we're going to talk about something that I'm very passionate about, which is called dysautonomia and POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And I've titled this talk, The First Key to Understanding is Awareness. I'm a, I'm a cardiologist, and I've subspecialized in cardiac electrophysiology, which makes me an electrical heart doctor, a heart rhythm doctor. And, you know, I want to I wanna kind of start off this talk um, with a little story. And, you know, like many other doctors, uh, we didn't really get an education on dysautonomia or POTS in medical school. At least I didn't. And I remember right after I got out of my training, being on call on the weekend and seeing a, a 21-year-old girl in the ICU who had just undergone brain surgery to remove a, menin a meningioma. And meningiomas, for, for those of you uh, that don't know, is a benign brain tumor. Most of the time, does not need to be removed. And I'd gone to sign out on this patient, and I'd gone to see her, you know, was not intending for, you know, me to add anything uh, all that relevant. And the reason, as cardiologists, we were seeing this patient is she had a fast heart rate. So in talking to her, I realized by digging in the, in the depths of my brain that she had had POTS. And I remember the one line that I had read in my text as a medical student about what POTS was. And so I, I had her, she was laying down in the bed. Her heart rate was you know, 70 or so, which is normal. And then I had her stand up and she went up to about 170 and she quickly became symptomatic. And I said to her, is this why you had the brain surgery? And she said, yes. They couldn't figure out why her heart rate was going so fast. They attributed it to her meningioma, which was benign and didn't need to be removed. And after this, I began realizing and seeing more and more patients over the years with dysautonomia and POTS. And I don't know if it's becoming more prevalent or I've just become more aware and I've just learned a lot more. But I think it's very important, it's very underappreciated and not really well understood by the medical profession in general. So today we're going to talk about dysautonomia and POTS. And to give you a little background about where this comes from, there's a real failure of the medical system to diagnose and appreciate the severity of symptoms. Clinical symptoms are supported by biological mechanisms. They are real, but yet they're still not very well completely understood, and there's a lot of research that's being undergone. People who suffer from dysautonomia and POTS are often embarrassed, feel socially marginalized, and made to feel psychologically very vulnerable. And the worst part of it is time to a diagnosis often can be years. Patients will go doctor to doctor, ologist to ologist, and many times are more likely to be referred to a psychiatrist than a medical doctor for a real medical issue. So here we have the HRS guidelines, the Heart Rhythm Society guidelines. The last guidelines on POTS was written in 2015. And the first thing I want to highlight here that they state, anxiety and somatic vigilance are noted to be higher in POTS. Why do I think that's important? Well, I think here's where the crux of the problem is. You know, when a patient comes to a doctor and they have a diagnosis of POTS or they have a diagnosis of dysautonomia and they're, or they're suspected of having that, they're automatically labeled as being anxious or hypervigilant. But in the next quote, you'll see in this same guideline, that detailed physiologic and psychometric studies have shown that although anxiety is commonly present in patients with POTS, the heart rate response to orthostatic stress, meaning from uh, a laying to a standing position, is not, is not caused by anxiety, but is instead a response to an underlying physiologic abnormality. And I think this is really important. And we're going to go into some more detail here in a second. So here we have the dysautonomia guidelines. To my knowledge, no guidelines have ever been written about dysautonomia. So let's talk about POTS. In doing my research, I came across a review article from the American College of Cardiology titled, Non-Pharmacological Treatment is the Mainstay of Therapy for POTS. And they go on to list a number of different typical treatments that a patient might be prescribed, starting with exercise conditioning. Exercise conditioning with a recumbent bike a rowing machine or swimming allows patients to exercise while uh, avoiding an upright posture. Theoretically, I think this is excellent. I think initially most patients, this is really not a, a feasible 
uh, a regimen, they come too symptomatic unless their symptoms are more on the mild side. And so initially uh, an exercise program might not be suitable for them. Medications. Medications for severe symptoms. Medications like propranolol, uh, midodrin, pyridostigmine, and fludrocortisone. These are medicines which have been around really for many, many years, prescribed for other reasons, uh, used to help support patients with severe symptoms and POTS. Increasing blood volume, and this can be accomplished by drinking three liters of water per day, and then liberalizing salt intake from five to 10 grams per day of sodium. Avoiding large uh, and heavy metals, and then as well avoiding alcohol intake and um, heat exposure. Um, heat can cause excessive sweating and obviously volume loss, and that might predispose someone uh, for, uh, to cause their heart rate to speed up. Uh, wearing compression stockings, uh, either thigh high or abdominal binders, I would say this is one of the most difficult things that I cannot get any patient to do. They're very uncomfortable for some patients, very difficult to get on. And so in general, um, I, find very, I find very low compliance uh, with these kinds of stockings and uh, abdominal binders. Sleeping with the head of the bed elevated and performing physical counter maneuvers such as leg crossing or squatting can uh, minimize symptoms. So the last uh, prescribed therapy in this review article was behavioral and cognitive therapy for anxiety, hypervigilance, and catastrophizing behaviors when they're present. And when I read this, I actually paused and was embarrassed that the medical profession would put this in a prescribed uh, treatment plan for patients with dysautonomia and POTS. Um, as a patient, I would be personally insulted to know that my doctor felt uh, that way about me. A patient with diabetes, high blood pressure, coronary disease is not treated in that way. We don't label them as being anxious or hypervigilant. We treat their underlying condition and we respect them as such. So let's get into a little bit of a discussion about dysautonomia. So dysautonomia is a large word really that discusses the, the a disease of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system has two parts. There's a sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The essential thing that the autonomic nervous system does is that it maintains a homeostasis and equilibrium. It is the unconscious regulation of various body functions in the body, uh, which is involuntary, opposed to our somatic nervous system, which is completely voluntary. The sympathetic nervous system neurons are located in the brainstem and spinal cord, while the parasympathetic nervous system is located near the target organ system. And here we have a, a large kind of complicated chart. And on one side, we have the sympathetic. On the other side, we have the parasympathetic. And we can really see the interplay with how these uh, systems coexist with each other in our bodies. In our, in our eyes, for example, pupil dilation and pupil constriction are regulated. Uh, our breathing, our heart rate, everything is regulated by the sympathetic and parasympathetic ner nervous system. We often think of it as fight or flight, eat or rest. So, you know, if you're, if you're resting, the parasympathetic nervous system in general slows our heart rate down, slows our breathing down. When you're getting ready to exercise or, or if you're scared or frightful, um, the heart rate will speed up, the breathing will, will start to go a little bit faster. And this is kind of the yin and the yang of the autonomic nervous system. So an overview, a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system or dysautonomia can either be underactive or overactive. And this can involve either limb of the, of the autonomic nervous system. It can be the sympathetic or the parasympathetic. And we can further divide these into primary and secondary disorders. Primary disorders include conditions like primary dysautonomia, uh, multiple system atrophy, and familial dysautonomia. Secondary disorders are, are much more common. We see them in conditions like diabetes, Parkinson's, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's disease, sarcoidosis, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis, celiac disease, Chiari malformation, amyloidosis, Guillain-Barre, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Lambert-Eaton, and HIV and Lyme. For the most part, the diagnosis of dysautonomia is a clinical one. There are a lot of fancy tests that one can do on the autonomic nervous system, but at the end of the day, I have not really found them to be all that helpful, and management really is a supportive one as no cure is currently available. So what are the clinical symptoms? If we think back to that chart that I showed earlier about 
uh, how the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems are at play, you can start to think about what kind of symptoms a patient might have. So imbalance, dizziness, fainting symptoms or, or feel, feelings of near faintness, uh, palpitations or feeling like your heart is racing, sweating, which is due to uh, a, an imbalance of thermoregulation, cold and heat intolerance, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, some of these patients will have something called gastroparesis, uh, forgetfulness and, and brain fog, shortness of breath, especially with exercise. They have exercise intolerance, chest pain, fatigue, insomnia, migraine headaches, and sensitivity to light and noise. And looking at this list, you can see most of these symptoms are very vague and common. You may even experience one or two of these. But, but patients with dysautonomia and POTS frequently have a constellation of these and often suffer from many of them. So let's talk a little bit about POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome as it's mostly called. It really is exists on the spectrum with dysautonomia. It is not truly a separate entity. It is defined by orthostatic intolerance, meaning when a patient goes from a laying to a standing position and is characterized by a heart rate increase of 30 be beats per minute or more with standing within 10 minutes of standing. In the absence of orthostatic hypotension or a drop in blood pressure where the systolic, where the upper number doesn't drop by 20 or the lower number doesn't drop by 10. Because in, in, in situations where the blood pressure drops, that might be another reason why the heart rate is speeding up. Most patients tend to be premenopausal pre females. Uh, more often, dizziness is the primary complaint, although fainting can occur, although it's a little bit less common. Now, a distinct entity from POTS is IST, or inappropriate sinus tachycardia, and this is not related to position. Cardiovascular deconditioning is common. As I said before, um, a lot of patients experience fatigue, inability to exercise, and shortness of breath with exercise. POTS can frequently coexist with neurocardiogenic syncope. A lot of these patients will have, you know, as we, in the layman term, vasovagal syncope, as well as other autonomic disorders. Triggers can include dehydration, prolonged standing, uh, drinking alcohol or caffeine, as well as stress and excessive heat. Treatment really is multifactorial. Um, the number one thing, and we always stress, is avoiding dehydration, and this includes avoiding alcohol and caffeine. Alcohol and caffeine will cause us to urinate more and therefore depleting our body of our volume and make you more predisposed to symptoms. Liberalizing salt and water intake. And this is something that I've only really appreciated in, in, in the recent past, but salt supplementation as much as possible can really uh, ameliorate symptoms very nicely without any other prescribed medications. And we like to target uh, at least three grams a day, really, if not more. Um, exercise, uh, once symptoms are under control, uh, a, a rigorous exercise program uh, to build up the skeletal muscles really does help. And I think a, a physical therapist with the knowledge of these conditions can really be helpful in this situation. Compression stockings and abdominal binders, although can work really well, again, I, I find in general very low compliance uh, with this therapy. And then medical therapies, and we're going to go a little bit into medical therapies. <clears throat> so. The medical therapies for dysautonomia and POTS really overlap um, and really depend on their symptomatology. The mainstay of therapy are beta blockers, and beta blockers are cardiac medicines, heart medicines that we've had for many years, and their primary um, reason that they're prescribed in this situation is to reduce the heart rate. The downside of beta blockers is that they also can reduce uh, blood pressure and lower blood pressure, and in patients sometimes who have dysautonomia may have low resting blood pressure, and so that may predispose them to fainting. Common medicines that are beta blockers are propanolol or indorol, metoprolol, and atenolol. Um, next, we have the calcium channel blockers, which is another class of medicines. Again, medicines which have been around for many years. And similar to the beta blockers, they can also reduce and lower heart rate and blood pressure. And, and similar to beta blockers, although they have the favorable effect of uh, slowing the heart rate down, they can also uh, lower their blood pressure, and that can sometimes make for intolerance to these medications. Common medicines like this can include medicines like verapamil or diltiazem. The next medicine is something called midodrin, and this is an old medicine that um, is given, um, and it is there to increase blood pressure. So patients who have hypotension or low blood pressure who are prone to dizziness and near fainting or may actually faint, we may prescribe midodrin. Uh, it's a very good medicine. 
Um, one of the downsides to imidadrine is that it's really prescribed three times a day due to its short half-life. The next medicine is fludrocortisone or Fluoronef. Uh, similar to imidadrine, it also can increase blood pressure uh, for the same reasons um, and can be very effective. The newest medicine um, in this class is called Northera or Droxydopa. And this can be a very potent uh, medicine to increase blood pressure and is for the most part we use in patients who have failed either midodrin or uh, fludrocortisone. Um, it's an excellent medicine that can really um, increase their blood pressure. And we'll go into a little bit more detail uh, in a few minutes. The next medicine on this list is called Evabridine or Corlinor. And this is uh, also a relatively new drug in the United States. And it has its only effect is to slow down the heart rate. So unlike the beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, there's no effect on blood pressure. So this makes it an ideal therapy for POTS patients. Other therapies that I've seen um, that uh, are out there are Mestinon, uh, SSRIs, which are kind of antidepressant and anxiety medicines, and pacemakers. I've had patients uh, come to me with pacemakers, but for the most part, these are really rarely indicated and uh, not really ever helpful um, in general. So what are the goals of treatment uh, when I see a patient with dysautonomia POTS? So the first thing is to identify what symptoms uh, they're suffering from and how that is impairing their quality of life. And then how can we then focus our therapy to limit side effects of therapy and limit their overall symptomatology? Most pa patients I feel would benefit from a digital blood pressure monitor. And this is uh, fairly uh, inexpensive. It can be gotten in any uh, retail pharmacy or, or even a, a supermarket. Um, I think frequent orthostatic vitals, um, especially during symptomatic episodes, um, is very helpful to log, to share with your doctor so that they can help guide and tailor your therapy. I think frequent visits initially, especially uh, upon diagnosis and treatment, um, is very helpful rather than spacing them out as time elapses and patients become less symptomatic. Uh, less visits are, are usually needed. Again, pacemakers are really rarely ever indicated for these patients. And then sinus node modifications and ablations are also rarely indicated. I've gotten a, a number of different referrals uh, to ablate or burn the sinus node, which is the heart's natural pacemaker to slow it down. Uh, these these uh, procedures are often um, not very easy to accomplish and not successful. And for the most part, symptoms can be controlled with uh, more simpler measures. So I wanna then focus on uh, this new drug, Corlinor. Corlinor or Evabridine um, has been available actually in Europe for a number of years and only recently became available in the United States. It's an amazing drug. Um, it's really a, a great drug for patients who have uh, POTS or suffer with POTS. Again, it's specific to the heart rate. It slows the heart rate down and doesn't affect the blood pressure. So this really makes it an ideal therapy for those patients. It affects something called the funny sodium channel in the heart. It's actually called the funny channel, believe it or not. Um, and, and so this drug actually blocks that channel inside the heart and that's how it has its effect. The only real issue with Corlinor that, I, that we find is that it's uh, very expensive. Um, in the United States, the only indication for prescribing Corlinor is actually for heart failure. There is no indication for POTS. It's not a commonly prescribed medicine for heart failure. And so a lot of patients find other means of obtaining this drug frequently from overseas and mail order. Um, I want to shift gears and talk a little bit about Northera uh, or Droxydopa. Uh, and this is the counterpoint to Corlinor. This is a drug that affects blood pressure. It's a potent um, medicine which can really uh, raise someone's blood pressure who might be, feel like they're fainting or nearly fainting and has no real effect on heart rate. Um, Again, the biggest issue with this drug is that we need to monitor supine blood pressure. So obviously we want the blood pressure to go up when we're standing, but when someone is sleeping at night, uh, we don't want their blood pressure to be that high. And in, in drugs like Northera, um, that blood pressure can actually go up quite a bit. So, so we wanna take uh, vital signs at home when the patient is sleeping to see what that actually is, and then we can adjust their therapy as needed. Um, the limiting factor with Nothera, uh, uh, similar to Corlinor, is cost. And as I mentioned, the supine hypertension. Unlike the Corlinor, um, I've had very good success in getting this drug approved uh, you know, through um, prior authorizations and peer-to-peer -peer reviews through insurance companies, but it can be a challenge uh, in some patients. 
Additionally, many insurances will require tilt table testing to make a, a concrete diagnosis of their uh, dysautonomia before doing a prior authorization. Some patients with dysautonomia can also have baseline hypertension, can have high blood pressure, and that can make treatment of their hypotension, their low blood pressure, really difficult. So they can have high, high blood pressure at one minute, and the next minute it can be really low. So the typical patient could have a systolic pressure of 150, 160, and the next minute have a systolic pressure of 80 and then faint. And so we, we really have to kind of weigh the, um, the advantages and disadvantages uh, of these kinds of medicines when we prescribe them so that we don't cause their uh, hypertension to shoot up and cause other problems. So what are common conditions uh, uh, that uh, of patients who have dysautonomia? So I mentioned a, a long list earlier, and I'm just going to focus in on a few of them, the ones that I really see a lot. So diabetes. So diabetic patients um, can commonly have dysautonomia, especially patients who have long-standing uncontrolled diabetes. These are the ones with high hemoglobin A1Cs, and, or maybe they didn't treat their uh, diabetes early on. Um, in addition to supportive care and, and treatment of the, their dysautonomia, treatment of their underlying diabetes is really critical. Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease is very underappreciated. Um, I, I, I've gotten a number of referrals over the years um, to put pacemakers or to do ablations for arrhythmias that these patients didn't have. And patients in particular who have advanced Parkinsonism um, can have dysautonomia and have very labile, very erratic blood pressures and, and faint. So focusing on that treatment can really make their quality of life really much better. Amyloidosis. So this is um, a genetic condition that can affect uh, many organ systems in the body including the brain, the heart, and the autonomic nervous system. It's an abnormal uh, protein uh, deposition, which causes this uh, issue. Um, the only, there are many different subtypes of amyloidosis. Currently, the um, HATTR subtype uh, is the only one actually recently um, that has a treatment available for those patients. So I want to focus in a little bit about a condition called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is a genetic disorder with a autosomal dominant um, inheritance. Autosomal dominant means that if you inherit uh, one copy of the gene, so usually we get one copy of the gene from our mother and one copy of the gene from our father. If you inherit one of the genes, you'll have the disease. Now, patients with Ehlers-Danlos or EDS, as we also like to call it, um, can have variable expression. So although, um, let's say a, a mother may have EDS, uh, the patient may have EDS, but to a di different severity, maybe more mild or more severe, depending on that patient. Currently, we know that there are 13 different subtypes, although the most common type is hypermobility, which is type 3. And unfortunately, type 3 has no identifiable gene uh, that is currently available on the market. There's a significant female predilection, but males certainly can have EDS. So what are the common clinical features that we see in patients with um, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? So the first thing that we see most commonly is joint pain and hypermobility. These patients, this, this is what really impairs their quality of life. They have pain all over in many different joints. They have hypermobility and are prone to subluxation and actually dislocation of their joints. They suffer with imbalance, dizziness, fainting, palpitations in, in, in tachycardia or fast heart rate, sweating, cold and heat intolerance, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, diarrhea, and in particular, a lot of them can have gastroparesis, forgetfulness and brain fog, shortness of breath or exercise intolerance, chest pains, fatigue, insomnia, migraines, and insensitivity to light and noise. In addition, they can also have things like mast cell disorders, uh, resistance to anesthetic drugs, atrophic scarring of the skin, and soft velvety skin. And on this slide, you can see that I've highlighted a lot of these symptoms. And I, I bring this to your attention because if you refer back to the beginning, when we talked about symptoms related to the autonomic nervous system, this is identical. Patients with EDS almost universally will have dysautonomia at some point. And, and we have to uh, make sure that we identify it and treat it so that we can improve their quality of life. So what is the take home message? I think the take home message is that the management of dysautonomia in POTS requires a very systematic approach. Many patients actually feel reassured simply by giving a name to their disease, which was previously invisible to the medical world. 
while currently there is no cure, there's a lot of research being done, there's a lot of really good supportive management and therapies which can, which can improve the quality of life for many patients. I, so I have two offices. Uh, one is in Palm Beach Gardens on Burns Road here across from the hospital. The other one is in West Palm Beach across from Good Samaritan. Uh, you can also uh, find me at drdavidweissman.com. I'm currently offering uh, telehealth and virtual visits and uh, we're excited to uh, see you and, and talk about your condition. If you enjoyed this video, I have other videos and talks that you could uh, watch to learn more about other conditions. Thank you.